Hi, this is Kim Chanley for Tennis Reach. When we started this series, I said we would cover a lot of territory between zombies all the way up to athletes of God. So to keep that promise, I want to provide this overview video that describes this pathway from zombies to athletes of God. To explain this pathway, I want to borrow a concept from Josh Waiskin's book, The Art of Learning. Josh Waiskin was both a national chess champion and a world champion martial artist. And he wrote this book specifically to describe the step-by-step -step process of becoming a champion in any domain, whether it's chess or the martial arts. Josh Waiskin describes this process of learning as something going from big circles, medium circles, small circles, to no circles. And I think it's the best book that I ever read about the art of learning. So in regards to tennis, we start off with teaching kids big circles. Their movements are very large, their swings are very large and inefficient. And that's sort of the big circle uh, stage of learning. Well, as they become skillful players or more skillful players, if, uh, intermediate players, if you will, then these huge awkward strokes become a little bit more efficient, right? They become medium circles. And as they become really skillful players, four or five and above, if you will, and then all of a sudden the motions are even more compact. Now, what Josh Waiskin says is that you know, that's the normal path for learning for most people, but other champions go on to a higher stage, which is called no circles. So at the no circle stage, these motions and the power transmitted be, almost becomes invisible to the untrained eye. So that's the path that we're gonna be talking about today. However, to reach the pinnacle of skill, you become an athlete of God. The player needs several qualities that separate the good from the great. First, he or she needs great passion to persist through the ups and downs of learning. They must spend years building a deep knowledge and foundation of skill. Their long training and doing eventually produced the invisible power, the no circle action we see when Roger Federer plays tennis. And we start comparing their effortless and graceful action to the great performances of art, like the people who compare Federer to the great Russian dancer Barishnikov. In fact, they say the same thing about Steph Curry in basketball and so on. In sum, when you become an athlete of God, you have become not just an athlete, but an artist. In the video lesson that follows this one, we're going to take a close look at the energy flow of setting the spring and releasing the spring in Novak Djokovic's forehand. As you can see, I've drawn some yellow lines where I believe the energy starts to build in Novak's body as he sets the spring for the forehand. As I reviewed this video, I realized I had to step back and address some of the basic questions and provide more of a perspective about these things. For one thing, the reasonable viewer might just be skeptical about the whole energy flow thing. They could ask, hey Kim, how do you really know energy is building and flowing like you describe in the ripple of power? Fair enough. So I wanna show you what I think is very clear video evidence of this energy dynamic. But before I do that, I wanna say that videos and photos are great tools. And obviously we use them a lot here to try to explain what's going on. But I also wanna caution my viewers that video and images can be misleading if you don't have the right map or paradigm to interpret these photos and images. What do I mean? First of all, what is a paradigm? As business guru Stephen Covey put it very well, paradigms are powerful because they create the lens through which we see the world. And he says, if you want to make small changes in your life, work on attitude. But if you want big and primary changes, work on your paradigm. And that's what we're doing in this series of videos, trying to make big improvement in our tennis game by working on our tennis paradigms. The best example of the wrong paradigm holding up progress is Stephen Covey's description of man's paradigm for human flight. For 2,000 years, the paradigm for building a flying machine would be to copy the way birds flap their wings. 
Birds flapping their wings were closely studied by all the world's great thinkers, even Leonardo da Vinci. But as Covey points out, this paradigm failed every single time for 2,000 years. It wasn't until man understood the true paradigm of flight, which is Bernoulli's concept of air flowing over an air wing and higher pressure being greater than the lower pressure above the wing, causing the bird or whatever object to rise. Until we understood that principle correctly, we couldn't build a successful flying machine. So the reason man couldn't fly for 2,000 years wasn't a mental toughness problem. And we'll talk about this a little bit later in our series. So this was a paradigm problem. We had the wrong paradigm for interpreting all those drawings of what birds were doing flapping their wings. And not only did it never work, but it never could, despite all the training, sweat, and willpower that man brought to bear to the problem. I bring this up because we have a similar misunderstanding about paradigms and mental toughness in sports and in tennis. Now, at this point, some players and coaches might say, hey, Kim, you're overcomplicating this as usual. When I go out and play tennis, I don't have a paradigm in mind. I don't have a model about how I swing the racket. I just go out there and play. Well, sorry to say you still have a model in your mind when you're doing this because you couldn't move at all without that model. But you really have an unconscious model going on, sort of a default model, the untrained model, if you will. And in many cases, we have this unconscious default model about how we serve and how we stroke the ball. And that's the paradigm that I want to examine in, in the first part of this uh, article. For now, let's call it the title my master teacher, Doug King, called the swing model or paradigm. What are the elements of the swing model? The tendency of players to think about hitting the tennis ball something like a baseball swing a circular motion around a fixed axis. Most players are extremely focused on the arm and hand in holding the racket and accelerating the racket too quickly to the target. With these models in our mind, most players lose a connection to the main sources of power, the lower body, the legs, pelvis, and hips, and their swing becomes an upper torso and shoulder and arm exercise. The unconscious swing model is also reinforced by tennis instruction that continually urges players to get the racket back early and don't be late in the swing. This all contributes to this racket and arm centric thing. Instead of letting the body generate the power from the ground up through the legs, pelvis and hips. Instead of letting the racket lag behind, players move the racket forward as quickly and aggressively as possible once they've taken back the racket on a ground stroke or drop the racket back on the serve. All of these largely unconscious models operating in our mind and body create all sorts of problems with contact. All sorts of balls that are hit without the proper spin, trajectory, or directional control. Here is the real source of the so-called unforced errors we all commit too often with a swing model operating. So let's look exactly how the swing model worked in the serve of Dinara Safina the former world's number one women's player on the professional tour. Here at slide one, we see Safina in the trophy position. The racket is held in a vertical neutral position before the racket drop or collapse, which eventually leads to the swing. In slide two, as you can see, even as Safina starts to collapse or drop a racket for the swing, the powerful unconscious swing paradigm is taking over. She is beginning to pivot around too quickly to the target in a circular manner opening up her left shoulder. Already she has lost some of the stored power in her body. In slide three, which shows her full racket drop back, she is accelerating the pivot and rotation of her upper body to the target. In slide four, as Safina starts her maximum acceleration up into the hit, she plants her left leg, and now everything is pivoting too quickly to the front and down. In golf, they call this problem coming over the top and that pretty well describes what we're seeing. In slide five, we see that her right hip has changed from moving up to moving down. Her premature pivot to the front and her premature planning of the left leg is now dragging her body downward. In slide six, contact, 
we see the results of this poor execution of the swing model. She has lost all connection of power with her lower body, and she is dragging the racket down through the ball, generating a ball without the proper spin or trajectory control. As a result, it wasn't uncommon for Safina to make as many as 10 or more double faults in a match. How should the body look at the moment of contact on the serve? See the vast differences in Roger Federer's serve, where there is a straight line between Roger's right hip to his right hitting hand, preserving the power connection to the lower body at the moment of contact. Even more important, see that Roger's hitting side, his right leg, hip, arm, shoulder, are all rising through the hit at contact. And you see the dynamic pelvic hip snap or torque of the ripple of power is contributing major power as the racket makes contact with the ball in the serve, just as we saw this, or we'll see it again with Novak Djokovic on the forehand ground stroke. So you can see this more clearly. I put a yellow line next to Roger's right hip and foot at the moment of contact. A few frames later, we see that Roger's right hip and foot continue to rise through the contact phase of the serve. The racket must be rising through contact in order to impart the proper topspin and trajectory to bring the ball back into the court on the serve. This is a sharp difference from what we see in Safina's serve, where she is pulling down with the racket at contact. Returning to Safina in slide 7 and then 8, we see the aftermath of this poor swing paradigm. In a way, Safina has spun her hips into the ground, and she is arming the ball through the entire swing putting tremendous pressure on the shoulder, which leads to injuries. We see Safina has thrown the racket forward to the target, as many coaches recommend to their players serving. Again, this action leads to balls that are hit too flat and without enough trajectory over the net. You might be thinking that the service action is quite poor, and it is, but you also might be thinking that it's an isolated case of what I'm calling the swing paradigm. Yet a whole generation of women professional tennis players have built their serves in one way or another around this model. And the results? Well, each year since 2009, right around the time of the U.S. Open, tennis journalists run the Why Can't Women Serve article, lamenting and wringing their hands about the poor service action of most pro women players. And sure enough, last year was no different with this New York Times story that you see here. And for 10 years, these articles have not gotten us any closer to answering the question, why can't women serve? I want to take a stab at an answer, which I call the scarecrow arm action. And before I go on, I want to say that other leading coaches, including my master coach, Doug Ting, my former colleague, Jack Rohde, a pioneer coach and thinker in LA, and former ATP player, Jeff Salzenstein, have also written or presented material supporting my perspective. And if you do a Google search on Scarecrow Arm, you'll see several good instructional articles describing part of the Scarecrow action, which is the form that serve takes in the ripple of power paradigm on the serve. So yes, we're peeling back more layers of this ripple of power paradigm that we talked about in our first series of articles. Again, the ripple of power provides the paradigm or model of how the body generates power from the ground up into a fast-turning torso and an even faster-swinging arm. In this video article, which is already long enough, we don't have time to show the technique of the scarecrow arm action. But in sum, to answer the question posed each year by journalists, why can't women serve, my answer and this answer is supported by other coaches, is that women can't serve because they're working on the wrong paradigm for the serve. As long as most women pros look something like Safina on the serve, with this premature rotation of the hips and chest to the target, and with this flat or downward action of the racket through contact, their serves will never be as effective as they should be. This is similar to the problem Stephen Covey described when he pointed out that a bad paradigm for human flight a bad misunderstanding of the principles of flight never did work in 2,000 years of trying. Trying hard, training hard, becoming more positive or mentally tough is never going to make this poor paradigm for serving effective. We'll cover this issue in more detail in later lessons. 
but for now I urge my colleagues to just simply compare the follow-through action of every great server past and present and see that this scarecrow arm follow-through doesn't look anything like the subpoena serve. I've taught the service action to intermediate juniors in a handful of lessons and improved their serve significantly in the process. Were they great servers? No, but they were much better servers almost immediately by working on this correct paradigm for the serve. So the answer to the question of why women can't serve is staring us in the face. All we have to do is look at it with a new set of eyes, a new paradigm.